right, welcome everyone. Good to see faces out there. A few I recognize, but most I don't. Uh, I hope you're going to enjoy tonight. I think you will. Uh, we're going to be addressing this question, what does it mean to be human? And it might seem a little esoteric, but uh, if you start to think about the decisions that you have made already and decisions you will be making about uh, issues like when does life begin, when does life end, uh, what about somebody in a coma or somebody who has some disability, are all of those individuals equally human? These are things that we deal with, we don't even think about consciously, but uh, we need to be informed, we need to have an idea of what it is to be human. So tonight uh, we have two individuals, uh, Dr. S. Joshua Swamidas, uh, who's MD-PhD, Assistant Professor of Laboratory and Genomic Medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, on his website, he has, uh, as his area is computation at the intersection of medicine, chemistry, and biology. And with just talking with him a little bit before we started, he said, I'm really the only one, or at least I was the only one doing this. Now other people have gotten interested in that. And I hope he'll share a little bit more about exactly what it is that he does. And then also we have Dr. Steve Smith, who is associate professor in counseling, clinical and school psychology here at UCSB. And he is a licensed uh, clinical psychologist, and his area of expertise is in masculine identity and uh, psychotherapy of men and boys, especially in terms of grief counseling. And so likewise, hopefully he'll share some experiences from that and how that impacts on this question of what does it mean to be human. So without any further ado, Dr. Swaminath. Is this on? Great. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, the last time I was here, I think it was in 2012. I'm just out of curiosity. Is there any super seniors over here? You were there. Do you remember me? <laughs> well, it's good to see you again. Uh, today, um, I'm going to be talking to you about what it means to be human. And this is something I care about in a lot of ways, partly because I am a human. <laughs> uh, I'm also a medical doctor and a scientist, which means that I couldn't find the exit door in graduate school. <laughs> I was there for nine years. Um, I spent my entire 20s in graduate school, and I gotta tell you, they were great years. Uh, if you're thinking about graduate school, it's, it's a time, at least, especially if you're going, I mean, I, I, I'm talking about science for a moment. There's many, many loves that people have, but me, when I went to graduate school, that's when I really fell in love with science. It's what I do with really my entire life right now. That's what I've devoted my entire professional career to. Uh, and it's not that I'm the only one working at the intersection doing of, com of computation and medicine and biology and, and, uh, and, and chemistry. It's just that the specific area that I found, no one was working on, to be clear. <laughs> and, and what I do in my work is I work with a team of other students. Well, well I'm not a student anymore, I guess. I work with a team of students and postdocs. Um, and we go out to try and expand human knowledge in places where it's really significant, at least I think it is, because it might help us make medicine safer for children. We do things like machine learning, if you know what that is, or deep learning, to build mathematical models to understand how drugs are metabolized by livers and how they become toxic and how that's different from person to person and how that might be different in children. So maybe we might identify those drugs that might, uh, might injure children but might be safe for adults or might, might be okay for a person of one ethnicity but not another and really be able to understand what it is that causes those really rare hard to predict toxicities uh, that affect people in really big ways. And we were talking about this too, that's kind of what I'm known for, but, I, but I'm also a very curious and creative person so I start getting interested in lots of other things. So I've done some stuff in cancer genomics, some of the stuff we first developed uh, mathematically to make sense of ambiguous data and chemistry we ended up applying to, uh, to cancer genomes to be able to find out what are the mutations that are causing cancer. Uh, that got paper, uh, published just about a year ago as I was, uh, I was working with another MD-PhD student, uh, Ranjan Kumar here. And then more recently we've been working on really trying to get better ways to quantitatively analyze medical images to help doctors make fundamentally critical decisions. Like the one that we're really focused on right now is when a pathologist has to decide whether or not a kidney is good or not. So when someone 
passes away and, and we take their kidney, we gotta decide if it's good enough, we can transplant it. And if we transplant it to that other person, it, it's a way to kind of free them and cut them the cords from uh, their dialysis machine. It saves a ton of money, but it really improves their quality of life. And the biggest thing that keeps us from doing this is we just don't have enough kidneys, but we don't want to put a bad kidney in. And it turns out that these poor pathologists have to make a decision in just half an hour, and it can happen at any moment at the time. It could be like 2 a.m. in the morning. They have to wake up, bleary-eyed, looking through this complex image that isn't even fixed right to try and figure out if this is a good kidney or not. And we think we might actually be able to get a computer program to help with that, and that might actually be able to really help some patients as soon as like next year. Wouldn't that be great? So that's what I spend my time doing. I feel like it's significant. I feel like, in a way, this is one way to even think about what it means to be human. I feel like I'm made for this. And as I do what I'm made for, I come alive. And, and this is what it means to be human in some ways for me. Now, I understand that you're, you, some of you might be thinking, that's all really cool. I see some pretty colors on the screen. And that's good for him. I don't want to have anything to do with math. That's OK. Maybe, maybe that's just not what it means for you to be human. That's OK. <laughs> But the part that might still be there is that maybe you're made for something. And if you actually do that, there's something about you that comes alive. That's part of, I think, what it means to be human. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. That's the question I've been asked to answer here. What does it mean to be human? This is one of the great questions. And I need to start by saying that there's many good answers to this. This is one of those transcendent, grand questions that all great art and literature and, and uh, thought and conversation centers around in some way or another. It's like, what is it? that it means to be human, and we, we can't really pin it down. There is not a final answer. In fact, this is just maybe the opening bid. Uh, I, I actually gave a talk on this at another university two days ago on the same prompt, and I gave a different answer than I'm giving today. So by no means feel that this is the one answer that I'm arguing for. I'm just saying that this is probably part of what it means to be human. And I have to say both, uh, well, really this whole week, as I've been thinking about this question, there is a few images that have just been coming very strong to my mind. Uh, they've, they've had a very big impact on me. And this is one of them. Uh, do you see that? That's me. It's, it, it, with the screen, you can't see it terribly well because of the lights. Maybe someone can turn the lights down. But you can see me there. And then there's that little kiddo there. That, that's Caleb, my son. He's two years old. And he is just adorable right now. And that's my, uh, that's my father right there. And this, this was taken this last November and Thanksgiving. It's the last time we saw him. And uh, part of the reason why uh, this is, I've been on my mind so much is what happened this last Saturday. So I got a phone call late at night. And uh, we found out that unexpectedly my father had a heart attack and passed away right away. And that turned my entire life upside down. I had plane flights scheduled for here. There's a question about whether or not I was going to come. Um, there's just a whole sequence of emotions you go through trying to figure that out. We did not expect him to pass away. It was just sudden. Um, the first thought I had is, oh, because he lives alone right now. We were wondering, oh, was there someone with him, I hope? <laughs> there was, but I mean, and that was, that was like one point I was really thankful. Um, uh, I thought back to the time, and like the phone calls that I hadn't returned from him recently. <laughs> and I was sad about that. And, and I was just so grateful that I'd had such a positive time with him. And he got to meet Caleb. And, and they, they just had this beautiful time feeding ducks <laughs> and spending the day together. And I got to say, as I've been thinking through this, um, there's something so difficult about grief. Um, they say when you lose your father, especially as a guy in our culture for some reason, that this is significant. And I got to say that is very true here. My dad had a very looming presence in my life. Um, and it was a complex relationship with a lot of good and, and also some things that were more difficult. Um, and it's been hard to think about other things. And so that's kind of what I come into this with, with uh, an experience of, of being in grief. And, and it's really interesting, too, as I was been thinking about this, we normally do a dinner beforehand, and Steve was invited to that dinner. He couldn't come because of, of having to deal with people grieving what's happened here in Santa Barbara with the med slides that happened recently, right? Um, where lots of people, even if they haven't lost someone personally, they've been affected in profound ways. And, now, I don't, I don't pretend to know much about that, except to say that, that, that I'm in this place where I've been kind of thrust into, degree, into grief. Like, no one chooses to be in this place. At least you don't. But that's where I am. 
And I have to say one thing that's becoming clear to me, and I, and I, I, th I think I was starting to build to this, but it really feels true right now, is that one part of what it means to be human is to enter into grief. I think it's one of the most humanizing things about the human experience is when we enter into grief and we grieve well and we grieve publicly and we grieve honestly. And it, I, I think we find something else about ourselves, about our relationships with other people and, 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 and what, our, what our condition really is. I think we all know this, even if we haven't experienced that grief, because we know that there's something there that we're eventually gonna have to go through, and we're gonna have to walk through that door. And we know that we're gonna experience something that is intense, and that's gonna change us in ways that we can't really predict. And sometimes it can be really scary, but I'll tell you that there's something about entering into grief willingly, even when you're thrust into it, that is just deeply human. I do want to acknowledge I'm mean, a biologist and a scientist. Other animals grieve too. And we're a type of animal, we're continuous with the animal kingdom. I mean, I affirm evolution and all that. Uh, so for example, uh, you can see uh, you know, elephants, when an elephant, another elephant dies, they will be, they'll be very sad about it. They'll stay there for days, like poking it to see what'll happen and clearly showing all the signs of sadness that you might expect. Uh, there is an example more recently, a couple years ago, of a gorilla that actually had her baby die and, and, and carried it around for days. And there's actually been examples of chimpanzees like basically carrying the baby around for days, just sad. One, I mean, just treating it like a baby until it basically becomes unrecognizable. And that looks like grief to me. And you know, maybe you don't think that's grief, but it really does look like grief to me. There's like a real sadness there that I think we have to acknowledge. Now, when I say this, some people are feeling uncomfortable because they're like, but wait a minute, I thought we're really different. But like I say, we, we are continuous with, with this world that we find ourselves in. But I do also want to acknowledge while that's true, there is something different about how humans grieve. There's something different about how we grieve. So yeah, the, it's true that other animals grieve, it actually turns out that chimpanzees and elephants, and there's a couple other species, are really the exception. Most animals actually don't. So that's surprising. But then even among these few species that we do see what appears to be grief, it's very different than our type of grief. I'll give you a couple examples. One is grandparents. So this is my grand, uh, my my father with his grandson Caleb, and, and uh, isn't he happy? <laughs> it's funny. He's he just we were on the we were, <laughs> we were on the, uh, in the car on the way over here, um, and he kept on wanting to see pictures of grandpa. <laughs> he's just like happy to see him, and he, there's like this joy that came alive in him. And he's just a little two year old, and with my grandfather, too, and I'm sorry, with his grandfather, my father too. He he can be kind of a bit of a scary person, but with my with my son, he just like became alive and was gentle, and it was just beautiful to see. The thing that's really interesting was when you actually look at the animal kingdom, I don't know if there's any other animal that has grandfathers. There are a couple that have grandmothers. What I mean by that, yes, of course, in a genealogical sense, they have them. <laughs> but, and, you know, mothers will recognize their, their, their children, fathers will recognize their, their children, but grandmothers and grandparents don't generally recognize their grandkids. <laughs> They're just like another random person from the species. And so they wouldn't actually grieve if their grandfather died because they wouldn't actually recognize it as like a, something that's any different than another one <laughs> uh, that actually is there. Like I said, there are a couple exceptions. I mean, I want, I want to, this isn't like a hard and fast thing. I mean, we do see something resembling grandmothers among killer whales of all things. <laughs> and a couple other species, but that's because, uh, but it's still different because that's an entire family unit that's based around um, like the female matriarchal structure. Uh, but, and then once again, we see an absence of grandfathers. <laughs> and even if you actually look at human history, it turns out that grandparents are a very recent thing. We can actually measure the ages of people and you know, 20,000 years ago, 40,000 years, I'm not gonna get into the details of how, but it's by looking at teeth and there's ways that you can see the ratio of old people to young people and you find out that uh, for the vast majority of our development as a species, um, people were dying by the time they were 30, 35. And so they just weren't living enough, long enough to 
to have grandparents. And can you think about what it meant to be human if it didn't involve grandparents? <laughs> That's something that actually makes us quite different than, than a lot of other people. It's part of something that's distinct to the human experience. And like I say, like, I'm for a very good reason thinking about that now, right? But there's other things too. Um, I told you that uh, I was kind of thrust into the grief with what happened on, on Saturday, but, but there's been a more intentional sort of grief I've been going through for the last uh, several months. Uh, so this is the 50th year anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. That's significant, right? We had and have a segregated world, but there was a person who came who had a way to speak across some of those divides and inspire us to see a different way forward. And, and he was the best of us, and some of the worst of us ended up assassinating him, and we lost him at that point. I mean, he would be 89 years old today. We see him as in distant history, but it's quite possible that he could still be alive today. Just think about that for a moment. How would his voice have changed our conversations about race over the last five years? And there's this point where, you know, when I think about how far we've gone from uh, trying to find like a common family together and uh, being called, I mean, it, 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 there's just a lot of grief that I've been experiencing about the loss of a person from 50 years ago. Like, I'll tell you what, there's no animal grieving the loss of Martin Luther King. Like, there's something, you know, it's one thing to grieve your child that you see right in front of you that passes away, but the thing about it is that we have this ability to think about something as abstract as a person I've never met before 50 years ago, and think about the counterfactual, about what our world would have been like if he'd still lived and what we've really lost by his absence, and to find real genuine sadness there. That, uh, that, that's something truthful about the human experience. In fact, maybe even as I'm talking about this, some of you are thinking, maybe I'm sad about that too. <sighs> I'll say also, I would say that avoiding grief is something that really dehumanizes us. Now, to be clear, we're all human. There's nothing you can do that, that would take away any sense of, like, I think we all have human dignity and human rights. I'm not trying to say that. But there's times when we act like humans, and there's times when we act like animals, <laughs> if you know what I mean, or something that's, not, that's very dehumanized. And, and, and of course, actually, one of the ways how we dehumanize ourselves the most is when we don't actually treat other human beings as human beings. I'm in St. Louis. I'm from California originally. Um, and my, my family is from India, but I, I was born here in, in Buena Park. I went to school in, in the UC system, too, at University of California, Irvine. But I moved to St. Louis, and, um, and I moved there in you know, 2000, uh, 2009, 2010. And I was loving science. I found the thing that I was made for. I was loving it. I was in this like insulated world where like, things were working out well for me, and I was enjoying it. And St. Louis is a great city for me. It was, it's a great city to live in. I mean, it's great cost of living. You don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was able to actually buy a house like walking distance from my work. Just think about the luxury of that. Now, I know you all live in the dorms, but that's not going to last. <laughs> To the point you got to move out, get a real house, and, and you're going to have to commute if you stay in California. And I remember like commuting for hours and like to have like hours back in my life that I didn't have to be stuck in a car. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was great. I was loving St. Louis. And, um, and it never really struck me that St. Louis was a segregated city. It never hit me until something happened. And, and you guys have heard the story, but I want to tell you my experience through it. Well, what happened was Michael Brown. And that was in 2014. And it was remarkable because we've all gone through this before. There's this story of, of, of some sort of uh, injury that a black person goes through in, in our segregated world. It hits the news somehow. And there's actually a liturgy we have. We have a, a, a cultural way of absolving ourselves of guilt of this. What happens is that we look at that and we say, oh, maybe there was something bad that happened in this one case. This is not actually really descriptive of the whole story, but let's be sure, does this person really deserve our grief? 
And then we start really looking into the character of that person, and we find out that he's not a perfect person. And we say, oh, that, oh, so that wasn't actually a clear example of injustice. And then, we, and then we're okay with it. And, and I'll tell you, I know that liturgy. You know that liturgy too, right? It's great because it takes us out of grief. There's a tragedy. No one wants to enter into grief. And yet we, we walk out of it. And that's what I was doing too. And then there was a, I, I got lucky in a sense because I was watching on CNN Darren Wilson, who is not a bad guy. And I, and, I, and I mean, he's not evil. He's doing the best he knew how. But let me explain to you what he said. And I'm not trying to attack him. I'm just trying to explain what happened and, and how this impacted me. He was on CNN and he was asked, so would you do anything different? And do you feel like, um, I mean, are you losing sleep at night over this? And he said, I would do nothing different. I'm not losing sleep over this. What I did was exactly the right thing. And that floored me. Because even people in the military who shoot people and they die end up going at home torn up in their souls because they took a life. And it's only human to see in that, so, even if it was entire, let's grant for just a moment, even if you disagree with it, let's say it was a justified killing. Let's just say that. Let's just say that that was the right thing for him to do. It's not human to be okay with it. <laughs> There's this point where you have to sit there and go, whoa, this is really disturbing. I just took the life of a teenager. That even if what I needed to do and needed to be done, he didn't deserve to die. And yet what he did was just so monstrous to me. And then I, then I was like so disgusted by that. But then I realized, wait a minute, that's exactly what I'm doing. And I realized that I was not grieving the loss of a child. And it was just, I mean, like that was like a neighbor of mine. That the only reason I didn't see him as a neighbor is because St. Louis is segregated. And I just was hanging out around a lot of people that weren't in his community. And like, you know, I didn't know any of the people in his family. And like, you know... There's this point where, like, you know, I'm a Christian, too. We come from this point of view where we believe that everyone's a sinner. So when people are trying to assign blame, but as Christians, we should know the answer. It's everyone's fault. <laughs> and the fact that it's everyone's fault doesn't mean that, that that person doesn't deserve our grief. And there was just, like, this deep dishonesty that I see came alive in me that I, I just became just, uh, I mean, it really wasn't about Darren Wilson. I just saw in him myself, honestly. And um, so both actually my wife, who is from, who's white and from St. Louis, we just entered into this time of intentionally entering into grief and realizing that this world that we've inherited, that, that we didn't set it up this way, but it was set up by people with racial intent to cut me off from my brother. And that I accepted this world as an acceptable place and I was at peace with it. Yeah, what I really should have been doing is grieving it. That this is not the way the world is supposed to be. The world is supposed to be a place where, um, where when a black person dies, it's not like, well, that's something that black people need to be better at advocating for. Where it's rather we all say, but he is one of us too. And I mean, I say this, you know, I'm an Indian. I'm not actually black, and I'm not trying to pretend that I am. I think, like, you know, I've experienced enough racism to know that it's real, but it has not inhibited my life. Let's just be clear. And so part of this is just also realizing that, you know, the injuries that have been done to me are not as important as the injuries that have been done to other people sometimes. I can get so caught up by the ways I've been injured, but there's, there's especially as you take the time to hear the stories of what's really happened in this world and how it's been set up, and how it actually lures us all into being comfortable with profound injustice, and how we just accept it. And I think sometimes, I mean, honestly, I don't know how to fix St. Louis. I just don't. But I can say that one of the most truthful and important, and I would say humanizing things I've done is just being willing to enter into a, a prolonged grief about it and to be at least truthful about what I see in this instead of separating myself and being unwilling to enter in. Uh, in November, actually, we were in the middle of a reading group on Martin Luther King because I was really wanting to really not just go after the I have a dream speech, but to really see what this person had to say. We had our very first 
uh, meeting, and then two weeks later, the Stockley verdict came out. Do you guys follow news enough to know what I'm talking about? There was another black man that was shot by police officers, and the police officer was acquitted. The details are important, and I'm not even really trying to pick sides on what should have happened legally. That's actually not the point. And uh, what happened was is that there was protests throughout St. Louis. This is on the Del Mar Divide, literally just a couple hundred yards away from my house. And uh, there was a night, I mean, this happened on Friday, so there's protests on Friday. And I was just, you know, I was just really disturbed. Both my wife and I were disturbed about this. The next day, we were, um, we uh, were coming home, and it was bizarre, actually. As we were going down Skinker, which is right there by there, we saw buses and buses and buses. Like, it had to be a few hundred police officers going towards Del Mar, it, all in riot gear. And it was the most bizarre thing. We went to dinner, and we came back. It's like around 10 o'clock at night or so, approximately. And, and I looked at my wife, and we have a little two-year-old kid, and I said, you know what? I need to go out and see. Because one way to do this is just by, this is my wife here, too. She's the one who told me not to go out onto the street. <laughs> and, she's, and she was very opposed to it. And, and, and it makes sense, right? Because it seems a little dangerous. And frankly, it is a little dangerous. And, but there's this point where I realize, you know, this is my backyard. I need to see what's happening here. I didn't go to protest. I just wanted to witness what was happening. And this is what I saw. I saw a large number of nonviolent protesters. There was, there was actually a, there was a group of uh, three college students walking out there that were just like you. So I'm going a little bit over time. I'm, I'm sorry. Is that okay? <laughs> but, uh, but they were, I asked them, like, why are you going out there? And they said, well, this just seemed, and, and the thing about it, one of them was a black kid from St. Louis. And she, um, the thing about St. Louis is in the 60s, they didn't protest. And the, the city was proud because they hadn't protested. They had their, their population more under control or something. I don't know. And, like, her parents never protested in the 60s. But she was, and I asked her, why are you protesting? Why are you doing something different than your parents? And she said, because isn't that just the responsible thing to do? And so they were going out. These were kids. They were, I mean, and like I was like, you know, that's right. <laughs> There's something true about that. We go there, and, uh, and you see the police officers lined up. And there's more police officers than there are protesters. It's nonviolent. And I was there as it turned, not from, I would say, nonviolent to violent, but I'd say violent to the point where there actually is an altercation and becomes a little bit destructive. So there was windows broken, but no people were attacked. And, but I'm telling you, it was disturbing to watch this because the police officers, I mean, we found out later that police officers were rounding up innocent bystanders that weren't even protesting and throwing them into jail. They uh, were, they, they were they actually literally, we have a friend who owns a restaurant in the central West End. They were actually, you know, assaulting just people having dinner in his restaurant. And they were walking down the street saying that they own the streets. And there's this point where, you know, you wonder like, what has happened to my world? And why is it that there's only black people upset about this? Why is it that pretty much only black people are there willing to say that this isn't right? You know, why isn't there Indians there? You know, why isn't it that white people find this appalling too? Why is this a black issue? This is, I mean, if we're all the same family, this is all of our problem. And I also felt this other thing, I'm a scientist, I love science. I think it's here to serve the common good. I think it change, can change the world. But in that moment, I felt like there's nothing my science could offer. Like, science can't name injustice, nor does it provide resources for it. And I remember even Martin Luther King explaining why he went to study a PhD in theology. <laughs> it's because he didn't see resources to deal with injustice in science, but he did in theology. And it wasn't in philosophy, it wasn't in psychology, it wasn't in sociology or politics. It was actually in theology. And he was a deep thinker there. And this is one thing that he said, which I think speaks to us in this moment. He said, America, as I look at you from afar, I wonder whether your moral and spiritual progress has been commensurate with your scientific progress. It seems to me that your moral progress lags behind your scientific progress. He said that a while ago. I think, I think it is to our moment. We figured out as a nation that segregation was wrong. 50 years ago at least, we have lived 50 years very comfortably continuing a segregated world. Our science has advanced. To what extent, at what point are we gonna say we don't wanna be segregated anymore? We really wanna integrate. 
And I don't know the answer. All I know is that I, I'm kind of caught in a world of grief. I just don't think that there's any other honest response to it. And as crazy as it sounds, I feel like that's the place where I've been coming most human. It's, in a way, it's very similar to the type of grief I'm experiencing with my father, but also very different, because it's, in a way, I'm kind of forced to grieve my father, but this is also a choice to grieve injustice. But one part that's similar is I don't actually know, I mean, actually, I, I, when I grieve, I don't actually know how to solve the problem of my dad passing away. I don't know how to solve the problem of, of, of what I've seen in St. Louis, but I also just know that I just don't know how to do anything more truthful to the situation than to be in this place of being honest about it, and honesty requires my sadness. Uh, so those are my thoughts. So I, I hope that makes some sense of a little bit of what it means to be human. And from there, I'll let, I'll let Steve continue. Mind if I close this up? Is this all right? Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, uh, first of all, my condolences. I think I think we're all with you on that. Um, and uh, certainly, as somebody who works with grief, um, there's no there's no easy thing to say about that, and no easy solutions. We just our hearts are with you on that. Um, so I, I'm going to do my best to, to answer the same question about what it, what it means to be a human. Um, and just to, to sort of set the scene for you a little bit, each year at our new student orientation in our department, all the faculty in my department, we stand up in a line. We introduce ourselves to the new students and uh, talk about what it is that we do and what it is that we're interested in. And some faculty say, well, I study autism. Others say, well, they, they study trauma, depression, marginalized populations, school violence, things like that. That's what my colleagues tend to say. But then when it comes to me, I say, I'm trying to figure out what it means to be a human being. It's totally a snarky answer. Um, and, and one of the reasons I offer a snarky answer is because my actual research has never been as interesting as what I consider to be my life work, which is trying to figure out what it means to be a human being. Thankfully, until tonight, no one's ever asked me for the answer. <laughs> I just, I was just there to give the snarky answer, and I thought I, was, I got away with it. Um, and really, you think that after all this time of saying that I've been trying to figure it out, I would have actually come up with a really good answer to that, but I'm not necessarily certain that I can. But let me start off by saying a few things here about science, because according to the flyer, uh, for this event, we're supposed to talk a little bit about science. And the thing to remember about science is that it's not a group of facts or an area of study or even a kind of knowledge. That what science is, is a methodology. Science is a method of generating hypotheses, gathering information, and observing the information that comes from that. And scientific methodology has given us many wonderful discoveries and encouraged critical thinking since the dawn of the Enlightenment. But science can only offer information on some types of questions, specifically those questions that deal with what I call, what we call fundamental reality, things that are actually real, like snails, okay? molecules, coconuts, that kind of stuff. How quickly things fall if you drop them from high up, science is pretty good about that sort of thing. But, but other questions about what does it mean to be a human? Um, what is the nature of love? What is the nature of beauty? How is it that we grieve? Those are things that don't lend themselves to the methodology of science. Clearly, there are many questions that, that science can answer for us because science, as we know it, is predicated on the idea that there is one knowable truth and that this may or may not be the case. And I, for one, am, am really happy when things remain mysteries. So, when I think about what it means to be a human, I think that in many ways, the answer to the question is inherent in the question itself. The answer to the question is inherent in the question itself. I believe that human beings are biological organisms who are compelled to create meaning. I'm not a biologist, not a comparative biologist, 
And my hunch is that dogs and honeybees and chickens don't have conversations like this. Um, I like my dog a lot. She's just not with me on this. <laughs> they don't wonder about what it's like to be a dog. They don't, honeybees don't wonder what it, what it means to be honeybees, or chickens don't wonder what it's like to be chickens. Even our nearest relative, the chimpanzee, is probably unlikely to hang out in trees somewhere and wonder what it means to be a chimpanzee. I'm just not sure that those animals have the same wonderment about meaning that we do. I'm not so sure that they feel the need to make things mean anything because my sense is that they experience life that is more of a moment and they are less concerned with the trappings of needing to make something mean anything. So again, what I think it means to be human is to have the capacity and need to wonder about what it means to be human. And that may sound like a bit of a cop-out, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit more. Research seems to suggest that only a handful of animals have consciousness of self. That is, perhaps only humans, great apes, dolphins, elephants. Not, not coincidentally, the animals who do seem to have a, a strong grief response understand their own unique individuality. And they seem to have some degree of understanding that they are embodied and unique as individuals. And as human beings, we have that capacity in spades. And at least in this current zeitgeist, we spend a lot of time thinking about ourselves and our own development and our own uniqueness. And now, of course, we take that uniqueness and we post it online for other people to look at and admire about how unique we are. Okay? Dogs, chickens, and honeybees don't do that. Okay? The other thing that seems to be unique among, uh, among uh, humans is our ability to predict the future and to travel backward in time. Although it may be true that some animals prepare for winter by collecting nuts or flying south for the winter to avoid, uh, avoid the cold or responding to the movements of their predators, it seems that perhaps only human beings can time travel. And we can think so far into the future that we can imagine years, decades, and even centuries from now which is, of course, why we have Star Trek and other awesome things. <laughs> of course, one of the things that we can then begin to think about is the inevitability of our own deaths. I believe that most, if not animals, have a survival instinct. We have a genotype that's selfish and wants to survive and replicate. But the ability to imagine one's own demise and the absence of being, I believe, is unique to human beings. So what that leaves us with, then, is a highly evolved sense of self-consciousness and individuality that is combined with the knowledge that we are mortal and will eventually die. And I think that as a species, we're not really into that idea at all. <laughs> that, idea, that is, that, that our self-consciousness, that our, our sense of uniqueness is dissonant with the idea of not existing anymore. We're way too important for that. And we know from research that dissonant, idea, dissonant ideas and feelings or beliefs make us feel completely out of whack. So what do we do? These two thoughts are not compatible. What I would say is that we create meaning. We create meaning to combat our feelings of dread and of chaos and anxiety about our own mortality. Uh, famous existentialist John Paul Sartre would even go way farther and say that things like human connection and even relationships um, uh, and love are just social constructs. Social constructs designed to keep us from feeling like we're utterly alone in the world. Sartre was so much fun to have at parties. <laughs> I'm not as bleak as that. But I do think that many of the things that we take for granted and consider to be real are in fact social constructions that we have designed to offer us meaning and protect us from a feeling of meaninglessness. So for example, here we are tonight in this great university where I am proud to be a faculty member. We have admission standards that means that some of you are here and some people are not here because they weren't able to get in. We engage in ritualized teaching and learning. And upon graduation, all of you get a piece of paper with your name on it. Hopefully it's spelled correctly. 
And what that piece of paper means that you have passed a relatively random number of courses, and now you're ready to enter the workplace or graduate school. But the university only exists because we agree that it exists. We have a socially contrived definition of what a university is. And we compare this against that definition that we have made up to see if it compares. And it kind of mostly does. It checks out. There is no proclamation that comes down from on high and helps us define what a university is. It is a thing that we have created. And the only reason that the paper that you get has any power is because we as a society have all agreed that that piece of paper has meaning to it. In and of itself, the paper has no meaning other than to say that a certain human being has had a relatively arbitrary set of experiences. <laughs> They're raising your tuition, did you, you know that? Um, <laughs> Now, I think those experiences are really important. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I think they're important in helping students become critical thinkers, uh, thoughtful citizens of the world, and careful consumers of media and science and those sorts of things. I think those experiences are important. But on some level, they are arbitrary. And other institutions work exactly the same as that. Government, laws, borders, and even gender and ethnicity are all things that we have constructed to help us understand what might otherwise feel like chaos and to help us maintain some sort of order. And within these constructions, we create a sense of meaning so that our membership in a university, a political party, a charity, a set of life goals give us a sense of meaning and purpose that ultimately helps us reconcile the dissonance between our own unique self-consciousness and feelings of self-worth and the knowledge that we are going to die. Now, I know that sounds like super bleak and nihilistic. And perhaps that could be one message. Social constructionists talk about the abyss as being the recognition that everything in society is entirely constructed, including science. And things that provide meaning and give us a sense of purpose and connection have no meaning apart from the meaning that we give to them. And we can look at that abyss as a place of terror where one is truly lost without lighthouses or any kind of guidepost. I think, but we can, we can, look, we can look at this interpretation as something that could be very freeing for us. Now, as a human being, I have my own self-interest, my own self-consciousness, and my own sense of uniqueness, as I'm sure most or all of you do. I may not like the fact that my life has no meaning other than the meaning that I give to it, but that allows me the freedom to choose. It allows me to choose what will be meaningful to me, where I will invest myself, my energy, my relationships, and my passions. We have the freedom to make meaning of whatever it is that we want. For some, it's science, others, it's religion, others, it's relationships and community, others, it's a sense of fulfillment, and even others look to money and fame. After uh, surviving a Nazi concentration camp, psychologist Viktor Frankl suggests that we should even make meaning of suffering because suffering is inevitable. What it means to be human is that we are all driven to find and make meaning. And when I think that, and when we think that meaning is something that comes from outside of us, then we lose our ability to make choices and to stand outside of the rules and what is expected of us. And we lose the freedom to give ourselves fully to the things that make us feel the most human. And the things that make us feel most human are often the relationships between us. The relationships we that we have with our friends, with our loved ones, with our families. Those relationships bring about our best selves because in those situations we are the most motivated to create the best meaning. The other constructions that we have in our society of education and learning and money and power and wealth those are the constructions that pull us away from our humanness, that often pull us away from the relationships that could be the most meaningful to us. 
The ability to create meaning, the ability to create our own purpose, gives us the opportunity to be our very best selves, and to give to others selflessly, even though part of us is carried away by our own uniqueness. Thank you. Well, we had this all organized that uh, each of the speakers was going to speak for exactly 10 minutes, sharing Sorry. in a nutshell uh, exactly what it means to be human. Hello, hello. But uh, I think uh, this was a little bit more informative in that uh, each of our speakers told more about their own humanity and uh, things that have shaped uh, who they are today. And uh, I've certainly got to know them much better than if uh, we just had canned 10-minute speeches. So I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. And while I'm doing that, uh, since we do have a limited amount of time, you have uh, little cards on the floor in front of you. If you would take those, and uh, hopefully you've been thinking about some of the things they've said. You may have questions of your own that uh, unrelated to what they said, but uh, maybe a reflection on what they said and uh, to write some questions. And in a few minutes, I'll have you pass those to the aisle, and uh, we'll try to answer a few of those questions while we still have time tonight. So can I ask him a question while we're waiting for that, yeah. if it's OK? Yeah, go right ahead. So thanks for sharing, Steve. Um, I guess I've, uh, one question I have is you kind of present everything is constructed. It's, uh, it's up to us and all that. Do you think injustice is just a construct? Like, do you think it's not actually really injustice happening in St. Louis uh, in segregation? That's just something we tell ourselves to give us meaning, and, and that is just, I mean, if you like that problem, then you go after it, or if you don't, no big deal. You go up, you go past it. it no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic question, and I, I think that kind of criticism has often been levied at, at a, as a social constructionist perspective. I do think that there are, and, and some people would go so far to say um, that the, you know, the taboos that we have in our culture against murder and those kinds of things are, are just social constructions. I don't buy that at all. I, I do believe that there is, there is pure injustice in the world. And um, so what, what injustice... Where, that, then? where does that come from? If everything is so constructed, how do we have a way to perceive? Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my, my feeling about that is that, that injustice robs others of their ability to make, make meaning in their lives. Right, it, it takes away opportunity for, for others to have their own their own chance to find their own source of meaning, and so I think that anything that it would encroach upon that, I, I'm with you on that. I think that is a, that is pure injustice. So then the the paradox we face is that to deal with the real injustice in this world, we have to be willing to encroach on our own freedom. But if what it means to be human is to kind of live out our freedom, how do we actually, I mean, in your world, how do you kind of make sense of making sacrifices for the sake of someone else's freedom? Well, because I, I believe that at a fundamental level, we, we, are, we are relational creatures. I mean, as a psychologist, for sure, I think that at, a, at the fundamental level, I'm not a nihilist. I'm not a nihilist. I do believe that there is something true and honest about humanity and, and the singularity of human relationships and connections. And, and in that, yes, although on some level a lot of us are self-serving, but I think broadly speaking we are relational people who are, who are clearly willing to give up or should be willing to give up for the betterment of all people. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that. It just seems a little bit, I'm trying to figure out how it fits in with other stuff. That's okay. I'm glad you're with me on the injustice. Um, yeah, thanks. That was my Do you have a question for me, maybe? <laughs> uh, sorry, I put you on the spot, so I want to give you a chance yeah, you to do did. the same. No, because I... Fairness there, yeah. No, no, I... I because I, I, I'm so with everything that you had to say. You're right, it, and it's... And, and I, I, I was grooving right along with you the whole time, and I didn't feel like there was anything different from what you said than what I said. I think we, we approached it from different perspectives. Well, I'd, say, I'd say one place where maybe it comes together when I actually do agree with you about social construction is that the way how our segregated world is set up is a way that was made by us. It's not like there's something intrinsic to us that makes it that way. P 
people chose to make it this way. That's right. And then we chose to accept it that's and then right. move forward. And it doesn't have to be this way, but that's what it is. Right. And one of the things that you have to be thoughtful about and reflective of it from a constructionist perspective is that the construction is made by the people in power. Right? And so anything that we tend to create, that we tend to construct, is something that is enforcing to the people who have and, um, and uh, disavowing of the people who have not. And so I think as, as educated people who are people who are thoughtful about the um, structures that we operate in, is wondering how the social constructions that we participate in, how do they oppress? What is their history of oppression? And to what extent are we contributing to that or fighting to rectify? And I, and I, think, I think academia has a history of oppression. And I think academia is doing wonderful things to rectify that. But it's also a way for people who have the, the access to education to, to push people out who haven't, traditionally speaking. So let me say one thing, and, then I'll, and I'll, I'll try and let our moderator say something. Because, you know. Great. <laughs> but so maybe, so I guess one logical jump you're making that would probably take it different ways. You're saying because we can construct such elaborate things that are false, and we and we want meaning, then maybe meaning is false. To some extent, that's what it sounds like. And I know you're kind of also kind of taking the Sartre a little bit facetiously, but I wonder maybe part of that's just because there is actually meaning in the world. And we're and, a, and we're actually primed to to look for it and find it, even though we'll go and create mm -hmm. alternate versions of it. Um, and so maybe that's actually a clue that some of it could be real. Like, I mean, like the whole issue of injustice, you think is real, and you think I, I think I think you would agree that what Martin Luther King did was meaningful and not a constructed meaningful. And maybe part of it's constructed, but there's something also essential to it, or intrinsic. I would hope, right? Yes. Um. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I, I think injustice is real because power is, is misused in order to serve the selves of those who are in power. That's, that's what I think. Um, that, that people who have been in power and, and who have privilege have abused that power and privilege in order to oppress other people. Yeah, so what I would say then is that Martin Luther King, when he kind of says in that place of injury that I'm not here just for the Negro, but I'm also here for the white person. That's right. That, that my issue is not to assert my community over your community, but to realize that we're the same community. I, I think that's not, I mean, yeah, he's trying to construct something. <laughs> He sees the possibility of something that's never been constructed before that he wants to make. So I'm not trying to say there's not a construction there. But I think it's objectively good what he's pointing us to and calling us to. That's, at least that's what I, what I feel and what I believe. I mean, maybe you don't, and that's OK. But. Well, I mean, I think you have to define, define good, right? I mean, and so one way of defining good is like, well, this is something that on the whole will uh, be a positive development for the entire social order. And I, and I think that that's true. But if you're talking about good and evil in ways that are, that are absolute, I don't know how to think about that exactly. Right, because that, that's... Well, I didn't say absolute, I said intrinsic, so there's a difference. Intrinsic, right? yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go with you on that. Yeah. All right. Sorry there. That's, that's fine, this is great. <laughs> So getting back to the question of uh, what it is that makes us, uh, what it is that uh, makes us human, and you both alluded to the fact that there are differences uh, between us and what we recognize as being animals, at least the majority of them. Uh, what, why are we different? And so uh, Dr. Schlemaske, you want to start on it? Why are we different? I mean, I guess that's one of the great grand questions. It's, it's, it's just as big of a question of how are we different? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's why are we different and how we get here? I think, I think that science gives us a good partial account, but science never gives complete accounts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that uh, it's very hard to explain 
exactly what it is, that, even in a, in a coherent, precise way, what is different, even though we know it's different. I think it's the same way it's hard to explain why we're different. Now, I can say that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, so the way how I think it makes sense is a paradox, where there's things that are simultaneously true that on face value seem in conflict. So I addressed one of them. I think that we're continuous with the animal kingdom. In traditional theology, it would say that we're all creatures, but that we also um, are, are, have something transcendent about us as well. And, and by transcendent, it means that we, we can't even put our finger on exactly what it is. <laughs> uh, so both those things are true at the same time. I think another one, too, and I think actually I like how Martin Luther King talks about it. I think his understanding of human nature gave a good grounding, a coherent understanding of what injustice was and how to deal with it. I think the way, and it's been interesting really reading him carefully over the last uh, four to five months. Uh, I think one way to summarize it is he said, he would say once again in very theological language that we're both, that we're all God imaged and we're also all fallen. And he had a critique of conservative Christians and liberal Christians. Liberal Christians don't like sin. And he's like, but look around at this world. Mm -hmm. It is really fallen. This is not the world that is supposed to be. And everyone has a capacity to participate in that craziness. And then he would also say God image. And, and we've kind of remembered a couple things about that. So what he meant by God image is universal dignity and universal rights. And that's some of the stuff that you're talking about. But he also had a couple of ideas that we've lost somewhat. One of them is that he really believed that all people had the capacity, even though if they were the most, most uh, vicious racist or ardent segregationist or a person intent on holding him back, that all those people had the capacity to respond to a call to justice. And so what's so weird about reading him, especially in our today, is he, he didn't give up on any group. And you know, we think that things are bad today, and things are bad today, but people, it was okay to be a public racist back then. Mm -hmm. And he thought that, that they were worth engaging. He didn't write them off. That's bizarre, it makes no sense. And it's because he really came to believe that God had placed in everyone this ability to respond to justice. Mm -hmm. And so he believed that that could happen. So he could go face a racist and say, you know what, I love you, I'm here for you too, I'm trying to invite you to be a better person, and I'm just as concerned about segregation for your sake as for my sake. And he was honest when he said it. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. And so when I'm in St. Louis, people talk about how it affects the black community, and it's true. It has a horrible effect on the black community. But I've also come to realize it has a horrible effect on the white community. It dehumanizes us. It cuts us off from our brother. Mm -hmm. And that the only way change is going to happen there is not if black people get better at protesting, but if white people come to understand that there is no two St. Louis's, or that we're all the same family. And that's, that's the last part of God's image. He saw God's image as not as something that rests on individual people all the time, but it's something that's expressed as we're in a common family together. He believed that even though we've never seen it ever, he believed that it's a distinct historical possibility that we could all live as one family one day. And that's not the seen order of the world. That's the unseen order of the world. And so I think that's, I think a good account of what injustice is and its, it's resources to have hope as we engage it. So, so I, I find that compelling. I mean, I've been really, really, uh, really impacted by not just taking the slogans from Martin Luther King, but actually reading them closely. Remind me of the question. So. <laughs> Why are we human, or what is it that makes us human? Oh, sorry, what is it? Yeah, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that makes us unique, or how, did we, how are we different? Um, you know, I think, I think so much of our differentness is just, uh, is, some of it is accidents of evolution, right? So evolution sort of... That's probably why we get white hair, right? <laughs> What's that? That's why we get white hair. It's not adaptive. It's just an accident, right? Absolutely. Um, why some of us cut it out. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think some of it is, is that. Um, and then, and, but I do think that there is, a, there is a fundamental piece of us that is relational in terms of, and unlike other animals, we, we do have the capacity to see our our clan or our tribe or our group as being much bigger than, than the local scene. Um, 
unfortunately, we don't act on that, as I think you've, you've addressed so eloquently, but we do have that capacity, and I think that is something that is, um, that is bigger and broader than, than what the animals typically can do. Sorry about going off topic. I got a little bit lost there. <laughs> okay. Do we have uh, audience questions about ready? I don't want to get uh, too far off track, so we run out of time because I do want to get time for that. All right. Great. And I thank you, all of you who contributed. We won't have time for every question, but I uh, want to give some of these. Okay. We construct meaning, but given our evolution over time and our inability at earlier stages of evolution to fully cognitively construct our meaning, are we not all needing to deconstruct who we are and where we came from prior to being able to reconstruct from anything resembling a blank state? Now, that is a mouthful, but uh, I think I can summarize that. How, how important you, is origins to understanding the meaning? Yeah. Is that what is he yeah, saying? How can you know where you're going if you don't understand where you came from? So. <laughs> Who asked that question? <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Do we need to know that? I mean, I, because I, I think there's a, um, uh, a certain part of our history as a species that I think is, is just generally unknowable. Um, and the gaps that we have, and that's certainly true about the gaps of our own lives and our own memories, is that we, we sort of fill things in as the best we can. Do we need to know that information to figure out where it is that we're going? Because I, I do think that on some level, we just have a choice to make. And, and we have the capacity to make the choice about what is it that we want to do with our humanity? What is it that we want to do with our culture? What is it what we want to do with our species and with our planet? And in my mind, the, uh, the need for an origin story I don't, I don't see that need quite so much. Um, I, think it's un, I think it's important biologically to understand our relationships to, to other animals and other creatures, um, but I don't need to know about this, the, the spark of humanity in some ways, because I think the most important thing is, is, what, is what is it that we wanna do with humanity now? What is it that we wanna do with what it means to be a person now? Yeah, so I guess I would take a, a little bit of a paradoxical answer that's a both and, and like it's kind of, it's gonna sound contradictory, but just give me a moment, and I'll try and be quicker. But I'd say in, um, in one sense, we don't need to know where we came from. Because I think, for example, we probably have some different views on origins, we both affirm evolution, but I think God created us, I think he designed us all. I think, I think that when uh, Martin Luther King's talking about the God's image on all people, he's not actually constructing, I mean, he's actually just describing the truth of this world, maybe you would say that's actually a really helpful story. Um, and, but I think it's, it's real, and that's, and that's okay, but I think what's interesting is though that we can actually still come to so much agreement, even though we disagree on that. And so in some really important ways, it's not important, right? <laughs> and I'm kind of glad, for example, that we can agree that genocide is wrong and we don't have to agree on origins. That's a really good thing, right? <laughs> Given how much disagreement on the origins are, if origins was that important, we'd have some big problems in this world. On the other hand, I would say where we come from is deeply ingrained in us too. I think we're the only species that if we're adopted, we really are deeply troubled to know who our real parents were. And, and we'll go on very long journeys to understand who we are by finding out about these people that we had zero relationship with. Think about that for a moment, that's bizarre. <laughs> And in a way, that's what we do when we look at human origins, too. We're trying to understand collectively where did we come from and where are we going. And I think where it becomes important is because there's a lot of things that we all agree upon. Like, we agree that genocide is wrong. We agree, we agree maybe not everyone here does or everyone in this country, sadly, but we agree that there's injustice in St. Louis. But what's also important is coherence and a grounding for it. That's like a philosophical term that I can actually explain why that's actually a real thing. That's not just something I'm making up to control you in my own bid for power. And I, and I think that's where origins sometimes 
can help us understand the things that are not just our private truths, but what are our public truths. Okay. What makes it self-evident that we human beings just create our own meanings? Isn't that also an assertion of faith? Where exactly does the purpose of being a better self come from? So, Steve? Faith. Sure. Right, I, I've got no problem with faith. I think faith is wonderful. I, I think uh, a lot of times people put their faith in, in all sorts of things that um, pe people like People like faith for a lot of different reasons. There are some people who, who believe that science is going to solve all the problems in the world. I call it sciencism. Um, and uh, faith can be wonderful in that regard. And I think all of us, to a certain extent, have to put faith in something, meaning that it's a belief in something or a belief in something that gives you a sense of meaning. Um, I forget the first part of the question. Can you hit me again? So what makes it self-evident oh. that we human beings just create our own meanings? So is there something, how do we know there isn't something beyond that? I don't think that we do. I, I don't think that there is knowledge. I mean, you can't prove a negative. So. Um, there's no way of, at least from my perspective, no way of knowing that there isn't something apart from the meaning that we create. But at least from my perspective, and as I look at it, I think that we have this desire and this need to create meaning. Um, and so we do. And so we, we construct things around that that give us that sense of meaning and that sense of purpose. And, we, and then we put our faith in those things. Um, and sometimes that faith is well placed and sometimes they're not. But can I say for certain? No, I, I, I can't say for certain that there isn't something beyond. I, I can't do that. Um, but the data that I have and the way that I look at things, I think, I think the meaning that we have is the meaning that we create. I guess the part where I agree with you is I, I do see humans creating false meaning everywhere. And I, and I think that's what you're getting at. We were talking about Silicon Valley without getting into details. And we, were, <laughs> and we were also talking about some of the absurdities of the academic game of being a professor. And so we clearly create false meaning everywhere. And so I would agree with you on that. But the fact that humans create false meaning everywhere does not mean that everything is meaningless. And so what that means is that we have, an, we have a, a, a preternatural ability to delude ourselves on what's meaningful. And that I would entirely agree with you. And I would say that we're actually so like fallen in that, that probably our only hope is actually if there was something outside ourselves that was able to kind of return to our story and show us true meaning somehow in a way. Can I respond? Yeah, I, 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 I want to be careful a little bit because I, um, I don't know that I would use the phrase false meaning. I would just say there's meaning and then there's not meaning. I think that some of the things that we put uh, a sense of meaning on are things that serve a greater good. And then there, I think that there are certain things that serve a personal good and then there are some things that serve merely to oppress. And so I, I think that real meaning and false meaning gets into a dichotomy that I, I think we have to be a little bit careful of. Well, I guess maybe a way to put it is, is I like actually how you phrased it. So I'll kind of go back to your earlier term of maybe we put our, our, our trust in things that don't deserve our trust. So we put our meaning in places that don't deserve that trust and then sometimes in places that do it. And we, and we create things to put our trust in all the time that aren't well-placed trust. That, I would agree with that. Totally agree, yep. All right, here's a very personal question. I live my life as an annihilist, not because I want to, but because I'm mentally incapable of believing in God, knowing all of the philosophy and knowledge. I'm jealous of people with belief because they have someone to pray to when they grieve or they feel loss. Who should I pray to if I can't believe in God's? That's great. Do you mind if I jump in on that? Please. Okay. Um, so um, 
so I was raised very, very Christian, and, and let me sort of speak to whoever that person was, but I, I come from a very Christian family, very Christian background. I actually considered going to seminary for a while when I was a teenager. Um, and the, the process of, uh, of losing my faith and losing my religion was probably the, one of the most painful periods of my life, uh, and not one that I entered into lightly largely because I knew that it would also disrupt the relationship that I have with my family, and that's been, that's been true for the past 30 years. It's just kind of ruined the relationship that I had with my parents before him. Um, and, and so that process of coming to a place of, um, if not uh, sort of a, a, an agnosticism, if not sort of leaning more towards an atheism, is not something that, that I've done easily and and the um the hunger that the person writes about in terms of losing that and and the desire and the wish to know who to pray to i understand that entirely and there have been many times in, in my life i'm like oh yeah i really really miss religion right now uh this would be like super handy um because it would just sort of help with all these things um and, a, and the, the feeling of aloneness that comes with that. What, what, where I have come to with that is um, maybe not comfort with being alone, but using that as a call to rely on other people and to sort of strengthen relationships that I have with, uh, with people around me and sort of finding love in, in people and in the greater good in humanity. So. And part of me will always have um, something, because it's part of my culture, part of the culture of how I grew up and so essential to my upbringing, that I will always feel that absence. But to me, that, that's not an absence of a higher power. That's an absence of something that is meaningful to my culture of origin. And so what do you do now with that? Like, how do you cope with that when you've sort of been through that process? What I would say, and I, I really look forward to hearing what you say, is, is, is find other things that, that give you peace and give you comfort and that are enhancing to other people and um, make you feel connected to people around you because, because in others is also solace. Uh, well, first I just wanna say, Steve, that I have a lot of respect for your story. Thank you for sharing something so personal. Um, I, I think I have a lot of respect for people who make costly decisions mm -hmm. and they change their mind. Um, I mean, I've had some of those myself, um, but it's really clear that that, that, that that was not an easy choice and it was, it was, it was something, and, it, and I wonder if maybe that's kind of where some of this construction stuff comes from. It maybe felt like a very man-made religion that you were leaving. Is that part of it? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if that's what it is, man, I think it's courageous and correct to leave a man-made religion. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I, I think that that's great. <laughs> um, I'll, I might be among the few Christians cheering you as you, as you did that. But, but I think, I think that, that this is too important to settle for something man-made. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I get that, and I respect it, and I, and I wish actually more Christians were willing to do that. Uh, to the person who wrote that question, that's also a very deep and personal question, too. I guess I would say um, there's an unknown um, variable in this place. So um, I would say that, that I grew up in a Christian family, too. I came to realize it was man-made. And I sifted through to sign, find out if there's anything in here that wasn't man-made. And actually, the vast majority of it was man-made, and I was willing to let go of and walk away from, too. But then I got lucky in the sense that I found something that really did not seem man-made. And so I guess I would just point to two things. And so it really comes down to like what your answer to is and how you respond to is if you're actually going to trust me in this moment to say that there might be something not man-made here. Um, and that's something that, that actually might actually be something bigger than what a man constructed. And if there is, if you could just see what happens. And I, would, and I would almost propose an experiment. And it's not really a scientific experiment, but just go with me. It's an analogy. <laughs> um, Maybe just pray and say, God, if you exist, I just want to see. 
show, 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 show me that you're real. I don't want to actually have an evidence-free belief or evidence-free faith. Just let me, let me have an experience of that and just see what happens. And maybe there won't be anything, and maybe there will. And the second thing that I, that I would just say, because I, I would just say I, I've experienced that, that there's like a living presence in this world uh, that it's, it's very hard to explain. And maybe if you come up and talk to me afterwards, I'll, I'll explain it to you later. It's just something that you kind of have to see to understand what I'm talking about. Um, but then the other thing that I found that takes that personal experience and that personal knowledge that other people talk about too, I'm not the only one who'll talk about it, but makes it a bit more concrete is what I encountered in Jesus. And I'll tell you, like, I mean, I'm, I'm a scientist around atheists all the time. Almost everyone is curious about Jesus. Some, he's kind of like Martin Luther King in some ways, or the other way around where, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say something blasphemous? I don't know. <laughs> But we're like, you know, there's something that we know that there's something very special that happened with Martin Luther King. Even people who don't believe that he's God, there's something very unique that happened 2,000 years that reshaped the entire world. And what I encountered actually was uh, the central piece of it that he keeps on pointing to, other people keep on pointing to, is this, this prediction that happens from 100 years ago, uh, 100 years before him. And then there's immense amounts of evidence, which was surprising. I thought faith was evidence-free belief, but then I found out that faith is better understood as trust in reasonable evidence. Um, that this, that 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 maybe it really is that 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 God exists and He's good and wants to be known, and He's revealing it by raising this man Jesus from the dead. And that doesn't mean that churches make any sense and that Christians do good things. And frankly, there's a lot of that stuff. I mean, honestly, I. I one of the saddest things I have to say is I've been grieving in St. Louis is just how bad Christians have been <laughs> in, 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 in dealing with this issue. Not, not all Christians, but many Christians, you know, maybe most Christians that I've known. And so this is not at all an apologetic for Christians. This is not at all a justification for every church. But I'll tell you that, that there's so much man-made stuff in Christianity. I'm willing to let go. I'm willing to let go of the Christianity label but I found something very real in Jesus, very compelling about him. And I found, that's, that's actually part of why I, I mean, honestly, it's actually, I see in him as maybe like the best example of what it means to be human. Um, so look, I understand that, that this is, may sound like crazy talk, especially coming from a scientist, but if, if you're there, this isn't about personality, it's not about your emotions. I'm, I'm talking to you about like some hard cold, you know, facts and evidence you can look at and see if you can make sense of and just wonder if that, that real presence really exists and if there is that God that wants to know you. Now, maybe you'll come to a different conclusion. That's fine. But, um, but I, I think that that, that that presence exists and can find you. And, I think, and, I, and, and I'll just to circle back, I think it helps when we're willing to leave the man-made religions. I, that's why I have so much respect for it. Um, so... It's not, I, I don't want you to feel any disrespect as I say this stuff at all. I mean, I think maybe the difference between us um, might be just that I came to experience something different on that. All right, in the current zeitgeist, how do you think shared systems of meaning can help create justice? How can it cross boundaries to empathy like race or gender? Shared systems of meaning. I think shared systems of meaning could could uh, just go a long way for ending uh, um, mistreatment of lots of people. I think one of the reasons that we we have so much injustice in the world is because we don't share a sense of meaning. I mean, in some ways, we've lost faith. I, I entirely agree. We've kind of lost a public common language. That's right. Yeah, we've lost we've lost the language of humanity and of greater good, and, and I think. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit beforehand in terms of w what what makes a self more individualized is is essentially power and wealth. And so you look back across history and across different cultures, cultures who have enjoyed um, 
uh, greater financial success have also become much more individualized because it's all about individual gain and capitalism and things like that. And, and in those moments, especially in the West now, where we have a very capitalistic and sort of self-indulgent culture, we've lost a common language of what it means to be human and what gives us a sense of meaning. And what that does is then, then we're trying to win, and, we're, and that's, that essentially is the birthplace of injustice, is one trying to um, usurp another. I mean, what, what, that's, that's what injustice is, and it, um, it negates one, one's access to power or one's access to self-actualization in that way. So I think one of the things that we really have lost as a culture is a shared understanding of what's meaningful, um, and I think that's why, I think it's one of the many reasons we're seeing so many problems. And we're so, just so fragmented, we're just so fragmented. I would totally agree. I mean, I think what's, what's really sad about our moment is that there's people who agree, but they use different language and they're fighting about language. Yeah. But they agree actually in things. I mean, a classic example of this is actually how conservatives and liberals, and I'm gonna mix in some religion here, talk about injustice. So. Liberals don't like the word sin. They don't like the word original sin, because wait a minute, there's something I, that, that you're saying that I'm responsible for that I didn't do, and they get angry about that, they think, I don't think sin exists, but I really care about injustice. A conservative say, well, sin is a real thing, original justice, sin is a real thing, but injustice, that's just a liberal fantasy. But wait a minute, let's just think about this for a moment. <laughs> to what extent are these different things? In fact, I think one of, the, I mean, I think actually there's actually a bit of more coherence if we actually start to see these things come to understand and come together. I think one of the big challenges we face in individualistic culture is why we personally should feel any responsibility for what our parents did. Think about that for a moment. Like, I didn't set up St. Louis the way it is as a segregated place, so why am I responsible for benefiting from it? It's kind of like if, you know, I uh, stole a hundred bucks from you, and then killed you, and then your son <laughs> came back, and I gave I gave that money to to Caleb. Well, let's do that. Unless I killed you, because <laughs> your your son's two years old, just like mine, right? right? And I took a hundred bucks from you when I did that. I'm gonna say a hundred thousand dollars. I'm I'm a little more uh, enterprising. And Good luck. <laughs> Because we don't have that much money. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. I'm a university professor. <laughs> you got to get the cost of living in St. Louis. Yeah, but anyways, um, anyways, let's just say, and then I, and let's say I just bequeath it to my son, and then and then your son, you know, he has a he has no father, and he grows up, and it impacts him, and then and then I, I pass away too, and then he kind of what's your what's your son's name? It's a little girl. Oh, what's your what's your girl's name? Stella. Stella. So Stella uh, <laughs> comes to Caleb, my beautiful kid, who's cute too. <laughs> yeah, he's very cute. Yeah, I see. Abigail agrees with me. Anyways, <laughs> and then and then he, he he says, "Wait a minute, my dad gave me the hundred thousand dollars. He worked hard for it. And you know, why do I owe you anything? Maybe I'll, I'll give you some charity. I'll give you five thousand bucks just because I'm a really nice guy." But go away. Is that fair? Is that fair? That's the world we face. We yeah. face a, a world right. where it's, it's shaped by ancestral sin. Mm -hmm. And even if you personally didn't do it, mm -hmm. we're in an interconnected world. Even if you'd like to think that you're your individual snowflake off in your own direction, you're shaped by this world. You benefit. I mean, one of the things that shocked me is like, if you look at income disparity, it's pretty large, but what blows you away if you look at wealth, wealth is not what people pay you, but it's like, for example, the equity in your house, the amount of money you have in the bank. You can guess what the multiple difference is between black wealth and white wealth. It's, you know, white people have 10 times more in the bank than black people. Why is that? You know, you can say it's because they're not smart enough or they weren't wise enough with the money. But um, let me tell you, if you start looking at the history, you'll find out that there's been generational theft. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying this as a person with vested interests. I'm not black. And I know that we don't know those stories because it serves us not to know those stories. 
it's kind of like Caleb saying, well, I don't know anything about my dad stealing $100,000 from your dad. So why am I responsible? Does his ignorance absolve him? Actually, his ignorance is the problem. That's right. And, you know, there's this point where I think there's actually a grounding for this when we actually start to realize that we're actually talking about the same thing sometimes. Like, this is actually something that is very well described as sin. It is also injustice. These are the same thing conservatives and liberals need to get on board and realize that the problem is not talking about sin. The problem is not talking about injustice. It's the problem is pretending like these are different things and having an argument about language and starting to actually deal with the craft that this world has left us. Yeah, that's great. Beautifully stated. Absolutely. All right. Uh, this is going to be our last question for tonight uh, as we do have a time we have to close things down and want to have some time people can talk after. All right, are you open to the idea that you are wrong, either one of you, and how do you deal with that? <laughs> After all that's been said. So, well, well, I mean, I guess, I, I think a better way to think about that is I think both of us have gone through major changes. So you were raised in a Christian family that really seemed like a man-made version of Christianity and you left it. And I have great respect for that. That was hard, it was costly. It gives you great credibility with me. Um, for me, I'll just say I went through a major change too. I was raised as a young earth creationist and as I encountered science and I looked at it, I made a very costly and personal decision to realize that you know maybe all these arguments I've been taught against evolution weren't really as strong as I've been led to believe. And even though it was very costly and my family was angry about it at times, I, I ended up actually coming to affirm evolutionary science. It was costly, and, and I realized that a lot of that anti-evolution was really man-made. When I actually looked at what God said in Scripture instead of what man said about what God said, I didn't actually find any contradictions. <laughs> and so there's a point where I have to realize, am I going to be willing to submit myself to what God said and what I see in this world, or am I going to care about what people think about me and do something that just is deceitful? And it was very difficult. And I, uh, and I made that choice. So the reason why, and then is, um, I guess, I'd like to think it's similar to yours. I just wasn't willing to settle for a man-made, man-made thing for something that really had to be more than man-made. I love being wrong about stuff. Um, I think it's great, I, and I've just gotten, as I've gotten older, I've just gotten better at it. Um, <laughs> I, I just, um, because that's learning. That's what learning is. And, and um, uh, you know, those of us who end up in, in academia are also people who generally like school, because we just choose never to leave it. Um, and so I love learning new things. I love learning that I was wrong about things before. And the things that I think now are really different than the things I thought five years ago. And, and hopefully they're going to be really different than the things I, I think five years from now. Um, life changes us and it, it shapes us in ways that we don't ever know. And so if, if any of us ever have the arrogance to think that we have it all figured out, we're going to live a life of suffering and sadness because life is just going to teach us things that we just never saw coming. Um, like you, I, I became a dad two years ago. My daughter has learned a lot of things in the past two years. I've learned a lot more. <laughs> and I learned a whole bunch of things that I, that I was really sure about before that I was really wrong about. And that's been marvelous, absolutely marvelous. The world as I knew it when I was your age is not the world that I live in now. And some of that is because the world is actually very different, but a lot of it is because I'm different too, because I've had to grow and I've had to learn and I've been wrong about a lot of stuff. So don't fear being wrong, like embrace being wrong because it's an opportunity to learn things. If you have a set mindset about anything, you're really closing yourself off. And especially these years that you're in college, it's just the most rich opportunity for you to say, wow, I really don't know anything. And that's great. That's just great. All right. Thank you, Dr. Smith, Dr. Swaminas. And now I'm going to...
hand off to our moderator to give us some closing comments, and we'll be done.